Medially, you have the saphenous branch of the femoral nerve, which begins very broadly, very broadly in the thigh, and narrows down to a taper just meet on the medial aspect of the second digit. So I will usually pinch the medial aspect of the second digit to evaluate this as far as any type of discomfort goes. Remember that a dog is many times hard to evaluate as far as pain sensation goes, and many times your fingernails are not adequate uh, as far as skin goes to evaluate it, whereas with your hemostat you can see that the dog can feel. Just very mild pressure on the skin, medially there, causes the dog to respond. Okay. So we've evaluated the sensa sensory branches as well as the motor branches of the uh, major nerves to the rear legs. Another reflex that is used, as is being done right here, is a flexor reflex. You can use noxious stimuli if you have an animal that's anxious or apprehensive, you'll many times remove it. Again, you need the sciatic to bring that up. You need the sciatic to flex that leg, that's what you're testing. Whenever you do these reflexes, remember, do them on the animal's leg that is up. The, altered, uh, the alteration of the reflexes by the animal having his weight on the down leg will alter your reflex responses dramatically and will allow them to be inadequate. The one other reflex that I usually test for is the crossed extensor reflex. You place noxious stimuli on the down limb and if the reflex is present, there will be extension of the limb which is on the upper side. This reflex is an abnormal reflex and is suggestive of upper motor neuron disease. And you can see this animal a little feeling pain, uh, just moves his limb in an attempt to get up. And again, you can see there is no crossed extensor reflex done here. Next, we evaluate the lower parts of the lumbosacral intumescence, S2 and S3. The anal sphincter, of course, is innervated bilaterally through S2 and S3 segments of the spinal cord. Usually, a noxious stimuli next to the anus will cause a pucker of the anus, as you can see here. The anus in this animal is not asymmetrical, it appears very tight. And again, stimulated, it will squint down a little. The anal tone is very difficult to evaluate, though, just on observation such as that. And it's our recommendation that even though an animal's anal sphincter may appear normal, that you go ahead and do a rectal examination on the animal and see if it is. And indeed, this animal has a very firm anal sphincter. It comes down very hard, very firm, and is indeed intact. It's easier to differentiate an upper motor neuron from a lower motor neuron anal sphincter by palpation than it is by direct observation. So this animal's anal sphincter is normal. Evaluation of the urinary tract is difficult. Abdominal palpation is the best way to evaluate that. Just say monosomy. Okay, the urinary system can be evaluated just on simple palpation. In a lower motor neuron type of bladder, usually you have a very large bladder, a bladder which overflows on palpation when you pick the animal up to put it on the table. This animal's bladder is small and firm. So he has a normal bladder. But this is the only way that you can really evaluate urinary uh, function in the dog. Now we'll move to the forelimbs as far as the reflexes to the forelimb are concerned. We really utilize uh, only a couple and these are not as reliable for us as the patellar reflex was in the rear limb. The first reflex that we utilize is the triceps reflex. 
you tap the triceps tendon just proximal to the olecranon. I like to firm up the tension on the tendon using my finger, just as I did with the gastrocnemius reflex, and then with a gentle tap of the hammer, you'll get a contraction of the triceps with a subsequent extension or attempted extension of the elbow, as you can see here. But as you can see, this reflex is not as exaggerated as some of those in the rear limb, and this is commonly true. Again, make sure that the animal is relaxed. The tricep three reflex basically is mediated by the radial nerve, which is C7, C8, T1, and T2 spinal cord segments. This is what I would consider a normal triceps reflex in a dog, barely perceptible, not nearly as exaggerated as those in the rear limbs. The other reflex that can be utilized is the biceps reflex. This is mediated through the musculocutaneous nerve. Again, palpate the biceps tendon, just proximal to the elbow. I like to increase the tension on that tendon by placing my finger over it, then tapping my finger. And this reflex is difficult to see, the biceps lying in here. It's very difficult for you to see it, but you feel it through the tendon. And this is even less in the normal dog than the triceps. So it's a barely perceptible reflex. You can see he just has a very mild flip of his foot. This reflex, as I said, was mediated through the musculocutaneous nerve, C6, T1, and T, uh, excuse me, C6, C7, and C8, the musculocutaneous nerve. As well in the forelimb, you're going to want to go ahead and test the flexor reflex. In this dog, I didn't even have to touch him. You can see he can move his leg all the way up. Basically, to flex the limb strongly in the, in the dog, the forelimb, requires all of the segments of the cervical intumescence to be intact, C6 to T2. You can see this dog goes ahead and retracts it without me doing anything. The sensation on the digits of a dog, basically the entire dorsal surface and the lateral aspect is the radial nerve. The median nerve is the medial aspect of the limb running this way with some overlap, and the ulnar nerve making up the predominant lateral palmar aspect of the foot with some overlap. So that when you test sensation, you want to test it all the way around in order to evaluate whether or not sensory function to the forelimb is intact. We've just finished the examination of the spinal reflexes, evaluating simple reflex arcs. What we need to remember is that we can also do the crossed extensor reflex in the forelimbs as we could in the rear limbs, and it's done in the exact same method. Next, we'll check the proprioceptive ability of the dog, or the ability of the dog to react to a change of joint position and sense, or basically, to know where his feet are. Does the animal, is he aware that his feet are at an abnormal, uh, in an abnormal position? In the dog, the way we evaluate this is to uh, flip the rear limb over, the toes over, such as this, and you can see this dog immediately wants to right his uh, feet, and he does right it. This is more correctly termed a postural reaction deficit because we know that the dog probably has some sensory fibers that tell him his skin on the wrong side of his foot is touching rather than just a joint position 
sense. But you can see he corrects this uh, rapidly, although this floor is slick. Okay, the other limb needs to be done as well. Um, you need to have some patience and do this multiple times, make the dog comfortable. But as you can see, this dog writes almost immediately. Okay, you can see that he does quite well there. Again, repeated in the forelimbs. It's much more difficult to have this abnormality in the forelimbs. It's much more difficult to elicit, rather. And you can see that this dog, again, writes himself quite well. While you have the dog like this, I like to have the dog have position his limb right under him, lift up the other limb, and get an idea, is he strong in that limb? And this dog, as you can see, is quite strong. Compare that with the opposite limb. Again, look for asymmetry. Again, position it under him, don't skew it off to one side, and you can see he's quite strong there. Again, do it in the forelimbs, make sure he's under that limb, and again, you can see this dog's quite strong. Again, do it to the other limb and look for any asymmetry. This gives you an idea as to the strength of the dog. The other thing that I like to do, as we just mentioned, proprioceptive deficits are difficult to evaluate in the forelimbs of the dog. What I like to do is to allow the dog to hop and to see, does he place the limb under him well? Does he get along on it well? And you can see this dog does. Do it the other way. And you can see this dog does quite well. He keeps it under him. And he's a very big dog on a very slick floor, but he does quite well. He keeps it under him. He doesn't high step with it. He doesn't overreach with it. The other thing that I like to do is allow the dog to him I walk. And you can see again, the dog does quite well. They do not do well when you bring them toward you. So you need to always move them away. And there, he corrects real well. Then you can turn him around and evaluate his other side. Okay, flip. Relax. Okay. Go ahead and evaluate this side. Again, he's symmetrical. And he does quite well with the hem I walk. And these are just uh, tests to evaluate proprioceptive ability in a more gross fashion. As well, you want to test the tail, see if the animal has strength. You can see he pulls it down. See how he pulls it down after I pull it out of uh, place. He seems to be strong there. He has some tone to his tail. And you want to always check that tail. With that, we complete the neurological examination.